There is, you know, incredible academic preparation happening here, incredible spiritual preparation and, and maturation and growth happening here. My success stories have really just been one after another. I, I, they're successful to me because I love to see people's lives change. It was a remarkable, a remarkable experience. Hello and welcome to Lattery Profiles. I'm Brian Howard. We're here on the campus of Brigham Young University, Idaho, and joining me today is Mark Kohler. Mark, welcome. Thanks for having me. What an honor. Mark, it's great to have you. Mark is a lawyer. He's a partner in a law firm, partner in also a CPA firm, an author, uh, does podcasts, radio, blogs, uh, you name it, YouTube. <laughs> You'll find him just about everywhere. And, uh, you know, got a variety of books out there. It's just uh, good to have you. You know, anytime you start doing research, it's like, Mark, you're everywhere. Well, you know? <laughs> well, if you're doing small business or trying to save taxes, maybe I'm everywhere, but I'm, yeah. Thank you for saying that. It's an honor. Well, it's good to have you here in Rexburg, uh, of all places, doing all those things. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your, about your background. Mark, where you're from, and let's talk about your career path. But where'd you grow up at? Well, Eastern Washington. So um, I love the Northwest, born in Oregon. I came out here to Rick's back in the day, mm. met my beautiful wife, Jennifer, and fell in love with Rexburg. And so as we then traveled around the country and finishing school and building a, a, our firms and things, uh, I always wanted to come back. Um, the small town mojo, I just need that vibe in my life. It's too crazy in Southern California and other places. So we ended up back here. Ah, but, well. Good. Four years ago. Good, good to have you. What got you interested in, in law? Was it something at an early age, or uh, when did you come across the idea that I want to go into that? Well, good, good question. I, in high school, I had a, a government teacher that I really liked, probably the class I related to the most, and a little bit of math, because I had that accounting piece in me, and then went off to um, University of Utah. Can I say that on the show? Oh, absolutely. Is that okay? We'll still All accept right. you. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, get my accounting degree, because I really felt that um, the numbers was the lifeblood of business. If you can understand a financial statement and a tax return, you're going to be a lot more valuable at the table. And then lo and behold, I have a tax lawyer as a teacher. Mm. And so when I saw you, you can be a lawyer and an accountant and ah, that match made in heaven, <laughs> I thought that's what I want to do. So I had some friends going to law school and I, my brother was going to law school. And so I said, I'll tag along. And, and then it, I just loved it. Came so uh, you're you're married. You went to Rick. So you're going to law school. You're married. What was that experience like? Because that's uh, I understand law school is not for the faint of heart. Yeah. Well, I, I, you you get a different answer if you ask my wife. She was a <laughs> trooper. We had three kids under three oh, wow. while going to law school. So we had twins, and so she was amazing. She held the family together. And you're right. It is a lot of work, but it's a neat it's a neat experience to be so immersed in education where they don't even want you to have a job and you're just hyper-focused on the law and you learn so much about the government and the United States and why we're here. And the, and then that's when I, of course, started to develop my concept of the American dream and how I really wanted to focus on small business. Mm -hmm. And and so it was, we went in Oregon, in Oregon to law school. So being in the Northwest, you know, Oregon and Washington, I'm a believer, you know, in Bigfoot. <laughs> so uh, if, if you've seen the documentary, Harry and the Hendersons, oh, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a good documentary. And, you know, you'll be a believer too. So. Uh, that's right, You're very true to life, just what goes on up there. You know, yeah. The woods. Uh, so we, once you graduate, obviously, you know, that's, that's the challenge. I think everybody, most people who go to law school either want, you know, something like a partner in a firm or something like that, that's kind of the goal. What was your path? How did you end up getting to where you are now? Well. It sounds exciting because I went on a LDS mission to uh, New York City. Hmm. So being in New York uh, in the late 80s, um, I know I look like a millennial, but it was, <laughs> it was in the 80s. And so I was uh, kind of that Wall Street um, image mesmerizes you. And then you go to law school and you think big city. But real quick, I realized, again, growing up in a small town in Washington on a farm, I wanted to be a small business type of specialist. And, Tax lawyers that work with small business owners are fairly rare because they all get sucked up into the big cities mm -hmm. and doing mergers and acquisitions and international law and all that. And and that was an opportunity, but um, my wife and I are like, no, let's, let's stick with the small business thing. So we went to Southern Utah mm -hmm. for a number of years and 
being a tax lawyer, I think I helped every business owner in the first six months. <laughs> and then I had to realize if I'm going to do this, I better expand. Yeah. Um, but it was a huge blessing. And, and the way media, of, with the advancement in media in the 90s and early 2000s where YouTube came alive, social media started to happen. And um, so I was able to start teaching my concepts to other small towns around the country mm. without having to live there. Yeah. And so that's that allowed me to specialize in the small business. Well, you've, so. you've expanded quite a bit. I mean, you've got offices in Cedar City here in Rexburg. Also, are you in Arizona? Where are there else are your offices? We, we have offices in Phoenix and then in Southern California. Okay. So we moved to Southern California a while, lived near the happiest place on earth, Disneyland. <laughs> of course. And then we got that out of our system and uh, we go back to visit a lot, but it's, it's tough. It's a rat race. And so... Um, that's where we moved from recently to come to Southern Idaho. So with these offices in, in the Western states, we still help clients all over the country. Mm. Um, and that's the beauty now too. You, you as a business owner can say, who do I need to work with? And it doesn't have to be someone down the street. Yeah, you can work cool. with someone in Florida if you have to, and if they know what you're doing. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. Uh, why did you decide, you know, the real focus on the small business owner? Was that uh, obviously the conscious decision, just the kind of people you like to work with, you wanted to help them out? What, what was the conscious decision? I like, right now? I like the way you said that. <laughs> they are people I like to work with. When you start working with big corporations, they're great people, but that's not their business. Mm -hmm. It's they're working in this huge machine and money is so you're so detached from this, these huge, humongous corporations. Am I really helping people or am I just helping this machine? And so, yes, some of my books are a little, you know, not conspiracy <laughs> theories, but I'm, I'm a little anti-Wall Street. I love Main Street America. And so you hear that more and more. Yeah. Um, Main Street versus Wall Street. Uh, Hillary Clinton talked a lot about that, even Donald Trump. And so from a political standpoint, it, there is this battle and so i chose sides so i chose main street and i love the small business owner because mm -hmm. when you're meeting with someone and you're helping them save money on their taxes or how do i build my business you're making an impact in someone's life right there and so it's very emotional oftentimes it's it's exciting it's very rewarding and we've been able to work on volume where we don't have to charge as much as a big city law firm but we can get more people through and still make our business model profitable and yeah. help more people. So, Well, you've been doing this pretty long. You probably have some good uh, stories where you've worked with people and things have turned out well. I don't wonder if it's share anything like that where you have people that you've worked with. It's like, oh, a small business owner, now they've had success stories. Yeah, well, um, right now, after this COVID uh, pandemic, before COVID, in, there was a lot of surveys that were wrapping up in 2018 and 19 where it was estimated one out of three working Americans had a side hustle. Mm. One in three have a small business. I bet if we went around the studio in here and said, who's driving Uber? Who's selling on Craigslist? Who's doing something on eBay or, or a little consulting or a little lawn care or auto detailing? A lot of people are having to make ends meet with yeah. a side hustle. That's an entrepreneur. Yeah. That's a small business. Man, I'm, I'm ready to talk. <laughs> and so, so there are so many people when they, that light goes off that, hey, I have a rental property, that's a small business? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now a whole world opens up of tax strategies and asset protection and wealth building and passing on a legacy and teaching your family about money. So many families don't talk about money at the dinner table mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship. So my success stories have really just been one after another. I They're successful to me because I love to see people's lives change. But sure. Seeing them just say, hey, I've got this side hustle. I didn't have to quit my day job, but I'm making some more money. I'm putting away a little bit more for retirement. I'm creating more cash flow. I'm paying off debt. And, oh, it's just awesome. Yeah. I'm wondering to tie this into you know your books. I want to talk about how you became an author, but I'm assuming that a lot of the, us do the side hustle thing. We're, we're probably pretty clueless about all the advantages we could get of having a small business. You know, we yeah. do, we buy, we sell something or do something like that and think, yeah. oh yeah, I made a few bucks. Uh, are we missing out? Are we missing the boat? We should be uh, really be paying oh. more attention to what we're doing. Man, you weren't paid to ask me that question either. I want to point that out because <laughs> yes, you are. Some people are missing the boat because from a tax standpoint, let's just talk taxes. Sure. Uh, I'll hit two or three points real fast. For, first taxes. Well, with a W-2 wage earner, you get your W-2, I maybe write off some home interest, some charity, but even with the new increased standard deduction, I'm not. millions of Americans aren't even itemizing anymore. Sure. 
So there's nothing to do. And you know, I can't save you any money. Oh, but you have a small business. Let's think of a rental property. Now I can write off cell phone, home office, auto, travel, dining, um, equipment, computers, laptops, all these things that I need to run my rental that I'm gonna buy anyway, but now they have a justifiable business expense. So I call them personal conversion expenses. Now I know we talk about on the show personal conversion all the time, <laughs> but I'm talking about personal conversion expenses. I'm gonna convert a personal expense to now a business expense. So now I can make more money, take right off side for stuff I was gonna pay for anyway, and pay a less ta a, a, a lower marginal tax rate because I'm, I'm making more money, but paying less taxes, that's a win. Yeah. Number two, a rental property can create cash flow. Now, by the way, I'm not selling rental property, I'm just using that example. I could be selling stuff on eBay or doing a little consulting business on the side. I'm gonna increase my cash flow in my life. Number three, I might increase more equity or wealth. Mm -hmm. Because if I can build some equity in a property or a small business, now I have something more to fall back on. And number four, that travel opportunity. Whenever I travel, I want to travel for business. If, why am I not buying rentals where my kids live, where grandma lives? Why am I not doing business when I travel? Now I get a write-off for that. And um, I'm creating more wealth as part of my lifestyle. And I'm teaching my family about it. I'm getting my kids or my parents involved as employees or board of directors. And it becomes a family affair. It's a lifestyle. Are you sold yet? Did I get you excited? I mean, I don't know. That sounds great. You know, I think for a lot of folks, I'm assuming, and I've had these conversations, probably scares a lot of people to death. It's like, oh, well, man, how do I even start that? Because it sounds like you start like write-offs and this and this. Like, oh, I'm scared. I don't know yeah. if I can do that. Well, it's funny you say that because a lot of people are like, oh, it's too risky yeah, to yeah. start a small business. I say it's too risky not to. Mm. Seriously, look, could you ever imagine a worldwide pandemic where you might lose your job? You know, if I would have said that a year and a half ago, everybody would have been like, mm, it's crazy. What's he smoking, you know? But seriously, the, the millions of Americans where their jobs were eliminated, they were laid off, they were moved home, they got reduced pay, unemployment. And what if they would have had a small business to fall back on? Why are we having small business as our safety net? So it doesn't have to be where you're investing thousands of dollars or getting an SBA loan. There's so many small businesses you can start for little or no money and start selling a service or a product or figuring things out. You don't have to invent something and have it made in China and shipped in on a cargo container. You can do all sorts of little businesses. And I love talking to students on campus about a small business. Graduating was a small business. I got excited about small business. I think you asked that earlier because I was a kid that always had the lemonade stamp. Yeah. You know, and, and when I was in college, I had probably three different businesses. And I felt that prepared me more for life than the the just solely right. focused on classes. I think the combination is where you really find that yeah, benefit. Find that nice spot right in the middle. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we got lots of great information. Is this when you decide? When do you decide to start writing books? I wrote down some of the titles in here. You've got uh, one of my favorites: "Lawyers Are Liars: oh, The Truth About Protecting Our Assets." I love that one. <laughs> Our CPA is not telling you the yeah. tax and legal uh, playbook, and you got four or five others. I think you've got lots yeah. of them out there. Uh, what motivated you to start putting, I guess, pen to paper, writing these books? Well, um, when you try to spread the good word of the American dream, uh, you want to use different mediums or methods. So a book creates a lot of credibility because you're putting your money where your mouth is. You're going to stand behind what you're saying. You're going to write it down. And that's a big deal. You know, it's, it's very uh, intimidating to say, okay, do I really believe this? Or I, people are going to read this. I better be able to back it up. So that's good to go through that process. And the book puts you on the map of Amazon and out there in the world. And then more people read it. But it's only one method of or medium. I Immediately when you start writing a book, you start writing blog articles. Mm. I like to uh, talk about how to write a book. Just start writing articles. The articles become the chapter chapters of your book. Yeah. So you start, you start writing blog articles. You start a book. You start doing a podcast. Um, so many people are now listening um, to audiobooks even yeah. more than the, uh, the paper. Is that real paper you're holding? Actually, I can't believe you're not paper. on an Can iPad. Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's old school. Very you old wouldn't school. catch any of these guys in, with a <laughs> paper. They're like, what is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, but then we start um, podcasting. YouTube has been huge for us. Um, YouTube is searched more daily than Google. Yeah. So if you want to know how to do something, you ask these young people in here again. Um, we're, if no one knows this, we're the old guys on the set. 
you know, they, they know how to run all this equipment. But um, yeah, YouTube's where it's at. And so all the, the books are part of that. And you know, I, it's fun to write, kind of dream of holing up in a cabin, you know, eating chili, <laughs> writing a book, and you disappear, and then you come back with this um, work of art. Yeah, we try. Yeah, it doesn't really work that way, does it? Uh, well, the book, the podcast, and the YouTube channel has gotten you noticed by national media. You've been asked to be a guest on lots of the shows, the business networks, Fox and MSNBC and such. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? Do you remember the first time that happened? That was probably kind of an interesting affair. Yeah, it, you know, um, well, spoiler alert, you, the news stations don't usually call you up to say, hey, will you come on our show? You have to start kind of making a name for yourself and beating down that door. Um, I'm sure people call up Dave Ramsey now and go, will you be on our show? But it didn't start yeah, out like that. Right. That was 20 years ago. He, you know, um, he was trying to build his, his brand as well. So it, you have to go out looking for that. And so we did. I started to just send my book around to producers and let people know, hey, if, you, if you're looking for an interview. Now, you were probably skeptical. Are we really going to interview an accountant on this show? <laughs> that, you know, he's telling his team, I'm sure, are we going to blow the show? No one's going to watch this. But um, as you can see, I try to be a little bit of a character and make things fun. And so when the producer, you have to kind of earn your keep in media sure. by doing the smaller shows. So you do like the lower, uh, the smaller um, markets. Like, like local TV station. Kind yeah, of. Your local TV. Then you get picked up by the bigger. And then all of a sudden, New York calls and goes, okay, you can be on our show. And I haven't been on the Today Show or GMA yet, but someday. But, but you, so you have to go on the show and then they realize, hey, this guy can make accounting sound interesting or legal, small business, and he's easy to understand. Let's have that guy back. And, and so that's where I've tried to build my unique characteristic is I could be on a panel on CNN with three or four other really, really smart people, but I'll be the one you remember that you understood. Mm. It's and, important. And, that, and that's my trying to be my claim to fame. I mean, I try to be smart, but there's a lot more people smarter than me, but I can help the average person understand it maybe a little bit better. Yeah, that's a big deal. Make it interesting, help us understand it. Uh, not, uh, yeah, that's because it's changing the channel faster. Than yeah. Maybe the I, don't, yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, beep. <laughs> well, well, you're here in Rexburg and you've had opportunity. You're actually serving on campus, right? In a bishopric. Tell yeah. us about that. What do, you, oh, what do you think about that? I love it. It's my most favorite calling ever. I used to be, scouting used to be my favorite calling until that's been decimated, right? Yeah, right? So, and I just loved scouting for years. Now all my little scouts have turned into college students. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of worked out for me. Um, and that's actually happened where I've had uh, uh, that experience, but I love being on campus and the college students are great. And so I get a chance to not only be a spiritual mentor, but to talk about business again and talk about this kind of stuff and students eat it up. It's shocking. I was in a class, um, it was a fireside or a class and I'm talking to so many students, I can't keep it straight, but I would said, how many of you know what a Roth IRA is? Mm -hmm. 50 students there, two raised their hand. Uh, how many of you know what a DBA is? And three people raised their hand. The DBA being a do, doing business as, like starting a sole proprietor. Three kids. I said, how many of you have your own small business right now? This was seniors, a oh. senior level class. I once asked that. Two kids raised their hands. And I'm like, do you know how marketable you'll be if you have a little small business and you go into an interview and they've got two, two students. One was straight A's, the other one was straight B's and A's, but one's had a small business, had payroll, hired and fired people, had to go out and make sales and knock on doors. Who do you think they're gonna hire? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's not always grades, it's creating that diverse um, personality and the strength not to get off your phone and look at someone and go, hey, do you wanna buy what I'm selling? It's tough. <laughs> you, know. Uh, you know, I've been thinking, uh, calling that a few years ago was with self-reliance. And it seems to be a message the church is really trying to send. You gotta yes. be self-reliant. One of those things is starting a small business, which was really popular. I had fun attending that class because people had a lot of great ideas. I, I think perhaps we don't look at it that way, but you know, self-reliance could be uh, running and starting your own business. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's not just food storage or getting out of debt or um, a savings account. All of those play in together. And, and it really is. It's Because think about it, in life, it's not always one thing. Right. It's a balance. It's a bunch of little things. It's, there are four or five legs under this table or whatever. And, and so 
having a small business, again, something to fall back on and creating a little extra income, the resources of that business can then fund the debt payoff faster, pay down the house faster, pay off the house faster, um, uh, fund my Roth or my 401k faster. And so that money conversation, I guess, to be honest, is a big one. Because again, like I said earlier, a lot of families, not that they're bad parents or bad families, but their parents didn't talk about money either. Sure. And they can villainize money. Rich people are bad. Right. Or making money means you're off kilter or whatever. And there's so many scriptural references. I love to teach a fireside and say, money's not bad. Render under seed is what is his. Pray over your fields and your flocks. Get out of debt. Don't be a slave. I mean, there's just scripture after scripture that talk about good money management. And tithing is not a, 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 a blank check to be irresponsible financially. Right. Oh, I pay my tithing. So, yeah. I, I don't need a budget. Uh, no, the tithing is supposed to help you be better financially. So I think the church has really embraced this and the self-reliance classes are awesome. They're so good. And I just dated myself. I said awesome, didn't I? I shouldn't have said that. I don't yeah. even know what to say anymore. Yeah, it's okay. Do not laugh at other than Yeah, I just think we just got a minute or two left. But, you know, you ended up at Ricks. You did a mission. Uh, all these things, I'm sure, shaped your perspective on your direction, especially, I think, you know, a lot of times uh, when people go into business, they're a little worried about being a, a good person, have high ethics and that kind of thing going into business. How has that, you know, kind of shaped your life and the direction, especially the kind of thing you want to do, helping the, the small business owner? Well, it's, I didn't expect you to ask that. That's a great question. Um, it is a little scary out there. You see, there's cultures that literally believe that if I can um, swindle you in this business deal, it's your fault, mm. not mine. You let your guard down, that's your fault. Like there's nothing wrong with that. And that's really scary. Um, there's other people that say, well, I go to church or I help my family, but when I'm in business, it's business, you know, and whatever I can do to eke out a dollar or whatever, I, I think that's really sad. We wanna make sure that we're consistent with all of our values and what we believe in. and how we treat people and uh, treating our employees and our vendors and the people we work with with respect and making sure they win in the transaction. If you're always trying to be so cheap and this happens in small towns all over America, Idaho or Utah, it's like, I gotta get a deal. Well, what about the guy or gal on the other side of the transaction? You know, make it a win-win. It's okay to pay someone and they can make a profit. And then you're gonna turn around and sell what you do and make a profit too, and that's okay. Be honest, make, make transactions mutually beneficial and be honest, it's easy to say, but it just needs to be said more often. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good thought. You know, the person you're buying from or selling to, it's got the same uh, problems as you do, and they yeah. need to buy and sell and make a profit as well. Yeah. Uh, Mark, what's the future for you? Uh, you know, continue on podcasting. By the way, name of the podcast, Main Street Business Podcast, correct? Yes, Main Street Business. You just Google that. Um, we have the Directed IRA Podcast. We actually have two of them. We love helping people self-direct their retirement accounts. A lot of people are fed up with what's in Wall Street, so we want people to take their retirement accounts, their Coverdales, their SEPs, their IRAs, Roths, and invest them in what they know best. Mm -hmm. It could be real estate or notes or gold or cryptocurrency, all sorts of things. So we love that. So we have a couple podcasts. You can get to my website, markjkohler.com, sign up for things. The future, I don't know. I'm going to start doing drywall, hair and nails, <laughs> um, driving truck. No, I'm just joking. I get so busy. I'm yeah. going to keep doing what I'm doing. So if you're following me on my website or on my social media, I've got so many great employees and partners in our law firm, and accounting firm, and trust company that will be there for you, help you win, live your dream, wherever right. it is. Let's get there. Mark, appreciate it. If you're looking again, check him out. You can Google Mark Kohler. He's going to show up on the podcast on YouTube, lots of different places. It's got books out there that uh, give you some great information. So, Mark, appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you so it. Much. Start your business. Let's <laughs> get it right, going. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Come visit. Get it going. <laughs>